because he must acknowledge God in creation. They are ignorantly groping after a sense of God. Paul is declaring time again. All these weeks, a month and a half to two months, he's teaching each and every day, and this is coming toward a crisis. is to tell this story in the context of evangelical Christianity, the heart and soul of Christianity, if you will. When God saved Philip, one of the first men that was converted under the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, the first thing on Philip's mind was to tell his best friend, Nathaniel, about what happened to him and what happened for him. John 1 Chapter 40, uh, verse 43, and we will skip verse 44, and I'll read verse 45 and 46. It tells us, the day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee, and findeth Philip, and, and saith unto him, follow me. Well, what happened next? Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. That is the essence of evangelical Christianity. That is the essence of the Reformation, if you will. As soon as Jesus found Philip, Philip reasoned, I have to tell my good friend. I have to tell him everything that has just happened to me. Philip said, Nathanael, we have found him. Who? Well, he was predicted by Moses and the prophets. This, in his embryonic state of Christianity, he knew very little about Christianity. He didn't know anything about doctrine, didn't know anything. But he told his friend everything that he knew about Jesus Christ. And he poured out his heart and soul to his friend and gave him all the information that he had. He is predicted by Moses and the prophets. He comes from Nazareth. He is the son of Joseph, and his name is Jesus. That's everything that Philip knew about the Lord Jesus Christ. I have seen him. I met with him. I know him now. He has changed my life. He has saved me from my sins. He is the Savior. He is the Messiah that we have been waiting for all of these centuries. Not only that, Nathaniel, he's close by. Philip reacted in astonishment. Literally, he said, how can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said, come and see. Isn't that the essence of the gospel? The essence of evangelical Christianity? It certainly was the essence of the Reformation. This evangelical zeal that Philip possessed was what motivated the Anabaptists for centuries after Philip died. It was the evangelical zeal that motivated Wycliffe to translate the Latin Vulgate into the English Bible and write books to, his, to, to, to the people of England so they could find Christ themselves. It is what motivated Huss and Jerome and Luther and Zwingli and Calvin and thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people since then. They simply wanted their friends and family to know the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the essence of the Reformation. They wanted all to have what they possessed, salvation by grace through faith. This is what salvation does to a man. It wants the world to know Everything about the Lord Jesus Christ. Come and see. 
was the cry from Philip the day that he was converted. The reformers and those who preceded them had this missionary spirit. But it didn't stop there. They were also grieved in their spirits over the dark cloud that hung over Europe during those many, many centuries called the Dark Ages. It was literally satanic darkness. Through their missionary zeal, through their desire to have their neighbors and their friends and their brothers and their sisters converted, untold millions have been set free from the bondage of Rome. How? How did this happen? Through the preaching of the gospel. That's how it happened. It was through the preaching of the gospel. It was men desiring for everybody to know about the Lord Jesus Christ. To become a true believer during the Dark Ages was a very, very serious matter. It, it not only necessitated a belief, a, a saving belief, a personal belief in the saving work of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it also necessitated a rejection of Rome and her heresies. Because of that, the price was very high. It is estimated that upwards of 50 million people lost their lives during the Dark Ages for believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. They were, they were murdered for their, for their faithfulness to New Testament principles and practices. Now, in order to preach the gospel, the reformers had to fight against error. It was necessary not only to tell the truth, but to tell everybody about the errors that they had been living under for such a long period of time. And I want to give a list of the major heresies that developed from the first century all the way until the 14th century, or the, or the 15th century. Early on, salvation became an admixture of works and grace. This happened during Paul's first missionary labor. His book to the Galatians tells them that he was very, very worried about them because they had already removed themselves from the true gospel. Judaizers were following Paul wherever he went, and they were telling Paul's converts that they needed to be circumcised in order to be saved. They needed to become a Jew in order to become a Christian. This was a perversion of the gospel. It was an admixture of works and grace. You needed to do this in order to believe this. So the first, the, the first century under Paul's ministry, this great heresy came into view. And it's never left us to this day. To this day, people believe in an admixture of works and grace. They believed also, men began to believe from a very early uh, period, even amongst the, the Talmudic Judaism, the tra tradition of men supersedes the authority of Scripture. There was the development of the church-state system under Constantine. The denying of the authority of the local vis visible body of believers became law. The rejection of salvation by grace alone became commonplace. The denial of the Bible as our only rule for faith, what we believe, and practice, how we live. The rejection of a believer's baptism by immersion. By 416 AD, infant baptism was established by law in the Roman Empire and was compulsory for every one of her subjects. They established Mariolity. The worship of Mary. They basically said, in essence, that Mary was a mediator. They made her the fourth person in the Godhead. And they told us, these priests, who told us that they were the mediator between God and man, these priests set up Mary as a priest who was the mediator between God and Je between man and Jesus. And then Jesus would be the mediator between, I'm not sure, at this point, it's so confusing, no one understood. So you have an earthly priest, Roman priest, you have Mary as a mediator between man and, 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 and Christ, then you have Christ, our great high priest, and then you have the Father. 
everything became convoluted, everything became confused, and nobody could really understand what was going on. That was design. It was purposeful, but purposefully done to confuse the masses. The, wor the worship of images, the worship of relics, saint worship, they would worship men who were dead. In 1229, the Bible was outlawed to be read by quote-unquote laymen, people like you and me, laymen, people that sat in pews. The persecuted were, that were found with any parts of the Bible or any, any writings contrary to the Church of Rome, that person was burned along with the books that he would carry. The church then established unum sanctum. Neither is there a salvation or remission of sins outside of the Roman Catholic Church. The doctrine of purgatory was established, where men were placed into limbo. You died, and there was no hope of salvation unless the priest allowed it. Then they concocted um, the selling of indulgences. You would pay the priest some money, he would forgive you of your sins for a couple of days or a couple of weeks, depending on how much money you gave him. You could give money to the priest to get your, your uncle out of purgatory. It might take weeks, might take months, might take hundreds of years. I don't know of anybody who ever escaped purgatory under the Roman church. Our missionary to Mexico has told us officially that the Church of Rome in Mexico has allowed seven people out of purgatory in Mexico up to this, up to, up to this point in time, officially. And then, of course, they had the confession of sins to the priest, and they did this to control the people. They would place a church in the middle of every small town in Europe. The bell would ring at noon. People would have to come to the church. They were completely controlled by all of her heresies, and they were controlled by confessing their sins to the priest. The priest knew everything about you. That was their power. The heresies that they propagated, stopping people from reading the word of God in their own language, and then confessing your sins to an earthly man that used it to keep his power over the people. So who were these reformers then? Well, there were millions of people before the 16th century, before Luther came on the scene, who were faithful New Testament Christians. They were members of local, visible bodies of churches, and they were scattered throughout Europe. They were the Anabaptists, hated by most, scorned by all, and slandered to this day. They never submitted to Rome, and they always spoke against her heresies, and yet they had no voice. They did not preach in great city churches. They were not members of any faculty of your universities. They were not allowed to go to the universities because they were criminals. They were not members of state. They simply had no influence. They were deemed criminals. They were wanderers who lived in the caves and the valleys of the Piedmont. Century after century after century, the Waldenses, the Albigenses, and the list goes on and on and on of their names. They carried portions of the Bible with them wherever they went. And they copied them and they gave them to whoever would take them. They held secret meetings in order not to be persecuted and murdered. But wherever they could preach the gospel, wherever they could give part of the word of God, they would do it. Because of their persecution, they were on the run. And they were going throughout Europe because they were hunted down. And they brought with them the word of God, and they preached the word of God, and the gospel kept going forth century after century after century through the great, our great forefathers, the Anabaptists. The Reformers, for the most part, were Roman Catholics. They were monks whom God had saved. In many ways, these men were very loyal to Rome. They did not want to leave Rome. Each and every great reformer was excommunicated from Rome, persecuted, some were imprisoned, and some were put to death by fire. None of them left on their own accord. They did truly desired to reform the church that they loved. 
It was necessary that God called these men. It was the only way the Reformation would take place. It was never going to happen amongst the Anabaptists. They had no influence. God had to raise up great men from within the Roman Catholic Church that had voices of prominence in order for the gospel to finally break through this millennium of darkness. When God saved these men, Luther, Calvin, and the rest, their first thought was to tell the world that Jesus Christ saves sinners, just like Philip. They wanted to tell everybody that the Bible is our only rule, our only standard for our faith, what we believe, our only standard for our practice, how we live. They wanted to tell everybody about the errors of Rome and how it contrasted what the Bible said. In doing that, they necessarily had to show the errors of Romanism. These loyal priests, these loyal monks, had to go against their church. They had no choice because they were now Christians, and they were faithful to the word of God, and so they necessarily had to go against the people that they lived. Wycliffe came on the scene 12 centuries, after 12 centuries of satanic darkness in Europe. God saved him, and he saw the errors of Rome. The first thing he did was translate the Latin Vulgate into the English language. Now, we don't esteem Wycliffe's translation very much. We as intellectual scholars of our day, that we have so much available to us, look down on Wycliffe's translation. There's two reasons. Number one is because he translated it from the Latin Vulgate. He didn't have Greek manuscripts. So it was a corrupted text from the beginning. The other reason why we don't like his Bible is because it was too simplistic. By design, Wycliffe made his translation as simple as he could for the common people to read. These people came out of the Dark Ages. They were a little bit more ignorant than our high school students in the 21st century. They were very, very ignorant people. They weren't able to, to, to read scholastics. And so Wycliffe made his Bible very simple so the common farmer, the common shoemaker could read the word of God. It transformed England and eventually transformed Europe. Rome condemned him as a heretic immediately. They tried him. And on numerous occasions, they attempted to murder him, all to no, no avail. John Huss, who, 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 who uh, predeceased the person that we are talking about today, Jerome, was a childhood friend of Jerome. They were, they were buddies. They hung out together as children. Wycliffe's writings got to Bohemia when John Huss was a little boy, a young man, a teenage boy. The reason in the providence of God is because Anne of Luxembourg, Bohemia, married Richard II of England. She came across the works of Wycliffe's writings. How? England and Bohemia were trading students. The best and the brightest of Bohemia were sent to Oxford, and some of the best and brightest of Oxford were sent to the University of Prague. When the Bohemian students got to England and went to Oxford, they read Wycliffe's works. They were converted. They brought them back to Bohemia and found them, saw them, read them, and was saved. She, came, she became a, law, a lifelong friend and supporter of John Wycliffe up to his death. She did everything she could to get his writings into the university so people could read his writings in order for them to find what she had found, the Lord Jesus Christ. Through this woman, through this great woman, one of the forgotten names in church history, if you will, the ministry of John Wycliffe had reached the darkest corners of the kingdom of Rome, and it illuminated the hearts and the minds of the people of Bohemia. John Huss was converted under her influence, under the influence of Wycliffe's writings while he was a student 
at the University of Prague. Well, how does Jerome fit into all this? We know that Huss was burned at the stake. How does this, this Jerome of Prague fit into this great line, if you will, of reformers, of all of whom which we know? We hear the name, but we really don't know much, too much about him. How does he fit into the mix? Well, the study of Jerome is a multifaceted story, if you will. It is basically the story of the converting grace of God in the lives of men and women. That's what all of these stories are about. It's about God saving sinners. We always want to make sure we understand that. Whenever we get into all the little details, remember this one thing, that Jesus Christ came down from heaven to save sinners. It is the story of the life, or the grace of God in the life of men and women. It is the story of a man who was consumed, literally, with telling everybody that he came into contact with about the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the story of love to a good friend. He loved John Huss. They were very, very close. It is the story of commitment to a good friend. And it is the story of his faithfulness to his good friend, John Huss. I see Jerome of Prague much the way I saw it. I see Jonathan and David. No doubt John was David and Jerome was Jonathan. The Bible tells us the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. If you want to know anything about Jerome of Prague, it really it stops right there. He simply supported his friend. That was his job. That's why he was called. He was, he was John's Melanchthon, if you will. It's also the story of intense trial and intense affliction. It's the story of fear. It's the story of a man who forsook his friends, because he did, Jerome fell. He forsook his friends. He forsook his cause. And he forsook the Lord Jesus Christ in his darkest hours. When Jerome was in that deep, dark dungeon being tortured, when he was at his lowest point, he experienced what Peter experienced the night of our Lord's arrest. At one point, Jerome cried out, I know not the man. It broke him. It broke his heart to do that. It was the worst day of his life, no doubt. But happily, the story does not end there. It is also the story of a stricken conscience. It's a story of restoration. It's the story of a restored fallen man to the grace of God for his failure in his greatest trial. Well, the story doesn't end there either. There's another half of this story. It is also the story about the demonic Roman Catholic Church's hatred of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no way to sugarcoat this. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. This is the situation that these men found themselves in. The enemies of the gospel used every means they could think of to crush the advancement of the kingdom of God on their watch. They employed intimidation, they employed deceit, torture, imprisonment, banishment, they hired mercenaries to plunder, to rape, and to murder, they raised armies, they waged war, and they caused the death of untold millions of human beings, and hundreds of thousands, or tens of thousands, I should say, of Hussites, all for the name of power. All came down to that one issue for the Roman Catholic Church, power. Not truth, not faithfulness, not love, but power. If there is one thing that we should take from these studies concerning these reformers, or the lives of these people, Wycliffe, Huss, and Jerome, it is this. 
men will allow any type of religion. Nobody cares about religion except one. Men will allow every type of religion a man can concoct, but they will not tolerate true biblical Christianity. Wycliffe, Huss, and Jerome, the Waldenses before them and during them, because the Waldenses came alongside them and helped during that great reformation, and all who were converted under their witness and testimony wanted the world to know that salvation is by grace alone. That the Bible is our only standard and nothing else matters. And Jesus Christ saves sinners by grace through faith. For this, the wrath of man came upon them all. Well, Jerome's childhood and education quickly then. Jerome was a boyhood friend of Huss and was educated at Prague. Because of his superior intellect, he was a natural genius. He went to four universities. He went to Prague. He went to the University of Heidelberg. He went to the University in Cologne in, 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 in uh, France. And he finally ended up at Oxford. While studying at Oxford, he came across the works of Wycliffe, and he was converted. Because of his mastery of the English language, he took Wycliffe's works, most of his Bible, and, and several of his works, and translated them into the, into the Bohemian language. He went back to Prague and brought these works with him. And when he got there, the Reformation had already begun through the great work of Anne of Luxembourg. His, his best friend, John, was already converted. What was he to do? He was so excited to bring all these works back, and revival, reformation, if you will, had already been raging in the land. So what did he do? He took up the cause of being Huss's assistant. He took up the cause and stood by his best friend, stood by the great reformer, John Huss. He never left his side. To, to get together, they defended John Wycliffe and his writings. They, did, they called John Wycliffe a holy man and said that his doctrines were more worthy than Augustine himself. They fought for the independence of the, of the Bohemian people from the Catholic Church, and they attacked the abuses of Roman heresy. Well, a council was soon formed in Germany, in Germany called the Council of Constance. And this council had one purpose, to stamp out the Reformation, to murder the reformers in order for them to stop having the influence they were having on the common people. This general council was formed in 1414 AD, and it was assembled in Constance, Germany. The purpose of the, of the council was to crush the progress of the Bohemian Reformation. On May 4th, 1415, the Inquisitors summoned John Wycliffe posthumously. Well, why would they do that? He had already been dead. They, bring Hust, they brought Huss in, he was already in prison, and then they summoned John Wycliffe to this council, a dead man. Why? They wanted to use John Wycliffe's writings and what he said and condemn him officially in Germany in order that they would not have to try Huss. If they could condemn Wycliffe, they could put, put all of that on Huss and simply put Huss to death without, him, without allowing him to stand before the council and give an answer for himself because it was too dangerous for them to do that. Huss was summoned to Constance, guaranteed safe conduct. They lied because he was... They, they deemed him a heretic. They did not owe him the truth. They arrested him. They put him in prison. And they eventually tried him and murdered him. They uh, left him in a dungeon for over a year. And they finally murdered him. They put him to death, by the way, on his birthday. The last words that came forth from John Huss's mouth was a quote from John 15, 22. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Well, Joan, Jerome was arrested while Huss was still in prison before he was put to death. John Huss was very concerned about Jerome because Jerome was such a faithful friend. And John wrote one of his friends and said, you need to keep Jerome from coming to Constance because they're going to arrest him and they're going to kill him. So we need to stop him from coming here. Jerome's friends could not convince him to uh, stay to stay away, 
and Jerome traveled to Constance, Germany to see what he could do to be a comfort to his friend. He arrived on April 4th, 1415, and learned that he could be of no help to his friend. In fact, he learned that he was going to be arrested himself. So he slipped out of town and found, and, and, and found his way into a small town in Germany. And while he was staying there, he wrote a letter to the Council of Constance and told them that he would go to Constance to stand before them if they would grant him safe conduct. They said, no, we will not, but we're still summoning you. So he left, he left Germany and tried to get back to, to Bohemia. And while he was on his way to Bohemia, the German authorities had arrested him, taken him to Constance, and thrown in, him into a dungeon to await trial. So he was simultaneously in prison in different cells and in different areas while John Huss was awaiting his execution. His imprisonment. He was in prison for a month and they took him to the Council of Constance and they mocked him, they derided him, they called him a heretic, and then they sent him back to his dungeon to endure extreme torture and suffering. His arms were crossed behind his back. They were chained to a beam above him. His head was cocked forward, and he was not allowed to sit down. He, he, they kept him like that for days, weeks, and months at a time. While John, Jerome was uh, rotting in prison, Huss was burned at the stake. The news quickly reached Prague that Huss had been murdered by the Romanists, and the result that the result was that all of Bohemia went into a, a rage. They were in a state of outrage, if you will, for the burning of their hero, which they called the Apostle of Bohemia. Because of the civil rest of Bohemia, the nobles of Bohemia that were loyal to Rome wrote the Council of Constance and told them, do everything you can not to put Jerome to death, because if you kill him, there is going to be civil unrest in our town, in our nation, and we will not be able to stop it. So do everything you can to condemn him, but you must let him go. Because if you do not, the winds of war will soon be here. They did everything they could to get Jerome to recant of his faith. They tortured him. They left him in that prison for a very, very long time. They deprived him of any, any comforts that you and I enjoy on a daily basis. And after he was completely broken down mentally and physically, the unthinkable happened. After a long internment of torture and abuse by the Romanists, deprivation, and in a moment of great spiritual and physical weakness, Jerome recanted his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He recoiled from the martyr's stake. He recoiled from the torture and the suffering that he had endured, and he chose to save his own life. He submitted himself to the council, and he condemned the writings of Wycliffe, and condemned his best friend, John Huss. He resubmitted himself to the Roman Catholic Church and promised never to preach anything against it. Jerome had fallen. It was a great day for Rome. He forsook his friend, he, for, he feared the fiery stake, and denied his heavenly master as sovereign Lord of heaven and earth. The good news is God is faithful to his children. Jerome had fallen, but God had not turned his back on his covenant child. And soon, Jerome would be lifted up once again. Even though Jerome had recanted, his enemies in the council were determined to put him to death. Even against the political advice of their allies in Bohemia, after he recanted, the, the, the council at Constance came up with 107 more charges against Jerome to make sure that he was put 
to death. While in his dungeon, of course, Jerome had realized the grave error, the horrible error that he had made, the dishonor that he had caused so many, and he recanted of his recantation while he was in his cell. He reaffirmed his allegiance to his Savior, to the truth of the gospel, to the works of John Wycliffe, and to his friend, John Huss. After, after close to one year in prison, May 4th, 1416, Jerome was brought before the council once again. The council feared the effect of this great man's words and tried to limit his answers to yes or no. And I need to read this, this, this dialogue, if you will, if you will allow this to me because it's very important. Jerome replied, what barbarity is this? For 340 days have I been confined in a variety of prisons. I have been shut up in the midst of filth and stench. There is not a misery and there is not a want that I have not experienced. To my enemies you have allowed the fullest scope of accusation. To me you deny the least opportunity of defense. You are a general counsel. In you, and in you center all this world can communicate of gravity, wisdom, and sanctity. But still, you are men. Take care not to sin against justice. The cause I plead is not my own cause. It is the cause of men. It is the cause of Christians. It is a cause which, which is to affect the rights of posterity. I exhort you not to deliver an unjust sentence. I speak less for myself than for you. His, his words caused the council to erupt into maddening outrage, and they stopped him from further eloquence. They agreed he should be heard two weeks later on May, tw on, on May 24, 1516. On that great day, he was brought back in his, in, his, in, his, in his prison garb. They shaved his head, and they made him stand before them in his humiliation. He, re he bitterly, once again, repented for forsaking his master and forsaking his best friend, and for, especially for forsaking the Christian faith. He avowed that he had done so in a moment of cowardice. He atoned for his sins with these words, quote, I knew him from his childhood, John Huss. He was a most excellent man, just and holy. He was condemned notwithstanding his innocence. He has ascended to heaven like Elias in the midst of flames. And from thence he will summon his judges to the dread tribunal of Christ. I also, I am ready to die. I will not recoil before the torments which are prepared for me by my enemies. And false witnesses who will one day have to render an account for their impostors before the great God whom nothing can deceive. The end of Jerome's heartfelt speech the council was humiliated and literally speechless, but not for long. Jerome continued on. Of all the sins that I have committed since my youth, none weighs so heavily on my mind and causes me such poignant remorse as that which I committed in this fatal place when I approved of the iniquitous sentence recorded against John Wycliffe and John Huss, my master and my friend. I confess from my heart and declare with horror that I condemn their doctrines, I therefore ask my Father to pardon me my sins. The council again erupted in rage and condemned him. They said, what need have we of further proof? The most obstinate of heretics is before us. Jerome replied, do you think that I fear to die? You have kept me a whole year in a frightful dungeon, more horrible than death. My flesh has literally rotted off my bones alive. He went on and said, Prove to me from the holy writings that I am in error, and I will abjure it. The cardinal replied, The holy writings? Is everything then to be judged by them? Who can understand them till the church has interpreted them? Jerome answered, What do I hear? Are the traditions of men more worthy of faith than the gospel of our Savior? Then cardinal, the cardinal jumped to his feet and shouted, Heretic! I repent having pleaded so long with you. I see that you are urged on by the devil. Jerome owned the hour and won the day. 
And for that, he was remanded back to his dungeon, and his persecution intensifies. His burning. He burned on May 30th, 1416. I've run out of time, I believe. Is that correct? Okay. He was brought once more before his accusers on that day, adorned with his chains. And he was asked a final time if he would recant. Jerome refused and was remanded to the secular power for execution. Rome rarely murdered people on their own. They always let the secular magistrates do their dirty work for them. A great crowd had gathered before them. Rome had figured out how to get the big crowds. Whenever there was a significant martyr to be murdered, they would always make that day a national holiday. Everybody would get the day off. They'd all go to the town square so they could watch this man be tortured to death and keep everybody in line. A great crowd gathered on that day, and they all followed Jerome to the holy spot where his friend had died one year earlier. He stood on a bench and asked again for forgiveness, for his approval in a moment of fear and weakness to burn his friend John Huss. The council then placed a paper miter on his head, a dunce cap, and they drew red devils on this dunce cap and put it on him, just like they did his friend John Huss. And Jerome mouthed the same words of his friends before him. As my Lord for me did wear a crown of thorns, so I for him do wear with joy this crown of ignominy. Jerome then kneeled down and prayed. When he did that, in the midst of his prayers, the magistrate, the executioner, grabbed him and brought him to the stake and chained him to the stake. He sang before the fire was lit, Hail, happy day. The the executioner applied the fire, the, 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 the wood behind Jerome, and was about to light the fire, and Jerome commanded the man to come forward. He said, kindle the fire before my face, for had I been afraid of the fire, I should not be here. The fire began to burn his body, and Jerome sang, into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. The fire continued to burn, and he was no longer heard, but the witnesses said that they could see him mouth his prayers to his Lord for the next 15 minutes. Like his friend before him, they gathered his ashes and they threw them into the Rhine River. Well, I've run out of time, so I just want to make a couple of comments to, to wrap this up. Much more had happened. The Hussite Wars, of course. Bohemia was in a rage. 452 Bohemian noblemen wrote a letter to Rome telling them that they wanted their religious freedom, their religious leader, uh, liberty, and they wanted to be free from the bondage of Rome. Rome was in no way going to allow that to happen. They swore allegiance to Wycliffe, to John Hust, and Jerome, and swore to protect Bohemia from Rome. When within four years of John Hus's death, the majority of the nation Embrace the faith for which he died. That's an amazing thing. It wasn't all good. Because of their murder, some of the people got a lynch mob, went up into the Senate house in the middle of town of Prague, took Roman, 13 Roman senators, threw them out the window, and they all landed on spears in the street. Well, this caused great problems for the Bohemian people, of course. Rome raised up an army by, by hiring German mercenaries to march into Prague, but God had raised up a great man by the name of John Ziska. He had raised up an army of 40,000 men to protect Bohemia, and they were met in the streets by these Bohemian brethren, by these Taborites, by these Hussite warriors, and they were summarily destroyed by John Ziska and his men. Well, the war raged for many, many years, and there were many, many battles, and it's impossible for me to go through it all, but I just want to hit on a couple of major ports, parts. Whenever you have a nation that, that is embroiled in such controversy, 
embroiled in reformation, embroiled in the gospel, embroiled in, 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 in Romish uh, tyranny like this, you're going to have factions. And a lot of the reformers, a lot of the reformed people didn't break entirely away from all of the sacramental worship of Rome. Many of them still wanted to keep them. They were, they were the liberal party of the Hussites, if you will. But there was a stronger a group called uh, the Taborites. And these were the people that were influenced by the Waldenses, the Anabaptists. And they held firmly to the New Testament pr principles of practice and faith. They were heavily influenced by these men. Well, they were enemies basically because of their doctrines, but they came together as Hussite warriors in order to fight off their common en enemy. Ziska, we must talk about Ziska for a moment. Ziska means one eye. His name was John D. Troutenau. And he was a great general, a great warrior. Some historians say that he was the greatest military genius that has ever lived. He lost his eye, his first eye, as a younger uh, soldier in, 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 in wars, as a young man, like I said. And uh, as a one-eyed general, he fought uh, all of his all the battles against Rome and, and, and literally won every single solitary one of them. There were 16 major battles that, that Ziska was in charge of, and he won all those battles against Rome. During one of the battles, he was hit in his good eye by an arrow, and he became completely blind. Armitage said he would take his stand on an elevation in the center of the battlefield with his best officers around him. Then he borrowed their eyes as he turned his empty sockets this way and that. His staff reported to him the progress of the fight, and he gave his imperious commands accordingly. Almost without fail, panic seized the Germans who were utterly routed again and again. At last, the emperor, finding that he could not do anything against him, offered him the government of Bohemia, the command of his own armies, and a yearly tribute if he would acknowledge the king of Germany as the king of Bohemia. Ziska declined, and soon afterwards he was overtaken by the, by the plague and killed. After his death, Rome was tireless in destroying the Bohemian people. Their goal was to exterminate every Hussite, every Bohemian reformer from the face of the land. The Romans continued on destroying the Christians in Bohemia for close to 100 years after the death of John Huss and Jerome of Prague. But there is good news concerning per persecution. If the Romish church has to come into your country and persecute you for 100 years, that's good news. And you're saying, how is that possible? Well, it means that the influence of Wycliffe, the influence of Huss, the influence of Jerome, the influence of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ had not died. People were being converted because of the influence of these reformers. During that period, God continued to raise up godly preachers. Men, women, and children were converted to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in contrast to, to that, Rome kept mowing them down. The more they rose up, Rome just kept mowing them down. The most prolific of them were, were the Bohemian brethren. Silvius, an ancient writer, said of this of them, it was a shame to the Italian priests that many of them had never read the New Testament. While scarcely a woman could be found among the Bohemians or the Taborites who could not answer any question respecting the Old or the New Testaments. These were educated Christians concerning the Word of God because of these great and godly reformers. Do I have five minutes? Never are the sins of men more, more prolific, if you will, when they commit sins in the name of religion. Religion gives the mind, the mind of man, 
license to commit the greatest of atrocities. And they always do it in the name of God. Rome capitalized on this, and the horrible reality is that they used ignorant people who followed them to commit these atrocious crimes against God's people. There was one event amongst the Bohemian Crusades where there was a very, very wicked priest. His name was Kekel. But he arrested 24 Bohemian Protestants. One of the 24 Protestants was his, uh, his son-in-law. They all faith, professed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Pekel condemned them all to die, to be drowned in the river Abbas. Hundreds came to the execution to, to watch this horror transpire. And one of the people in the audience was Pekel's daughter, the wife of the man that Pekel was about to murder. This man was going to murder his own son-in-law. She threw herself at her father's feet and begged him to pardon her husband. He replied, intercede not for him, child. He is a heretic, a vile heretic. She answered, whatever his faults may be, or however his opinions may differ from yours, he is still my husband, a name which at this time like this should alone employ, should alone employ my whole consideration. Her father flew into a rage and replied, you are mad. Cannot you, after the death of this one, have a much worthier husband? She replied, no. And death itself shall not dissolve my, my marriage vow. The 24 people were bound together and thrown into the river. The daughter at the, mo at the right moment threw herself into the river, grabbed her husband's feet, and went down to the bottom of the river into that watery grave. The Emperor Ferdinand of Germany employed the Jesuits to roam the countryside of Bohemia along with their mercenaries to murder the Protestants. Just a few examples. At one time, they shot an aged minister of the gospel while he was sleeping in his bed. They robbed and murdered another. They murdered a minister as he was preparing to enter into his pulpit. They raped a young girl before her father and then tortured him to death. They tied a minister and his wife together and lit them on fire. They tied another minister to a cross upside down and slowly broiled him to death. They placed gunpowder in one preacher's mouth, lit the gunpowder on fire and blew his head off. The list goes on and on and on of these persecutions by Rome to the Bohemian reformers. So how do I tie this together in this very long lecture? I do apologize for that. What is the influence of these great men? I'll just take a minute to tie this together. The Council of Constance did all that it could to kill the influence of the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what this was always about. God in his infinite mercy allowed these great and noble reformers to endure martyrs' deaths. God allowed that. Rome meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. They thought the English and Bohemian heresy had been stamped out for good when these men were put to death. Little did they know that they had scattered the seeds of the gospel all over the earth by killing these men. John Wycliffe, John Huss and Jerome Aprey were now etched into the eternal annals of history and the winds of the, Re the Reformation were blowing at gale force. And there was nothing that Rome could do to stop it. These men wanted to reform their church. These men simply wanted to point out some of the errors of Rome so they could be a better church and Rome would have none of it. Do you realize that to this day, Rome has never recanted of one of her heresies? Amen. Not one. She demands absolute servitude from her blind subjects. So 
So it was necessary that these men lived and died in order that the nations of Europe would be awakened from their slumber. The Bible was given to the common man. The seeds of religious freedom and liberty from tyrants began to course through the veins of men everywhere. God, through the ministry and testimony of these men, was saving souls, and men were being raised up to preach the gospel. That's the great significance of these reformers. Severe persecution continued on until 1516 in Bohemia. You think there's a, a gap between Wycliffe and Huss, and then you've got Luther a hundred years later. There is no gap. Persecution raged all the way to 1516. Armitage, Armitage called Bohemia the cradle of the Reformation. But what happened one year later? One year later, Luther was converted. Luther was converted. A great shining light came forth. Luther was converted. And what did Luther desire? What did he want? He wanted the same thing that Philip wanted. That's what Luther wanted. And that's what made the Reformation so wonderful. We have found him, of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, the son of Joseph, come and see. And many did, and many still are. This is the great influence of the Reformation and the evangelical spirit to tell people what God has done for them. It comes down to that, does it not? And with that, we will end this very lengthy lecture. We thank you for your patience.